so without further ado, I'm going to call our director, Professor Satyamuti, to kindly introduce the speaker and start the function. Thank you, Anand. Uh, there are some chairs in, in here. Some of the people standing in the back can sit here. Of course, the young ones can afford to stand for long. And I must tell Professor Ramakrishnan, this is probably the first time the hall is getting this uh, full. Sometimes <laughs> we worry about the empty seats, hoping that people will come and occupy them. Clearly, you can see the the speaker of the day is well known. I would like to make a few formal remarks. <coughs> First of all, I would like to welcome Professor Ramakrishnan to Aisar Mohali. I have done this this morning in the presence of a large number of class 11 students who are attending the Inspire camp here. And this occasion has brought in a large number of fellows of Indian National Science Academy which has awarded the Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Medal to Professor Ramakrishnan. Already several years ago, the Academy elected him a Foreign Fellow of the Academy. This year, this award goes to Dr. Ramakrishnan. And this is very prestigious from the Academy point of view, given once in three years. And this is given for international cooperation in science and technology and for contributions to public understanding of science. Uh, the formal citation would be read out by Dr. Chandrima Shah, Vice President in Sub, who is here to present it to him on behalf of the President, Dr. Raghavendra Kadakar, who could not be here, he is elsewhere uh, doing his job. And this, his predecessors, some of his predecessors were Liu Yong Xiang, the then president of Chinese Academy of Sciences. This was in 2010. And before that, it was David King from the UK. And uh, those of you who have, who have listened to him this morning addressing the school children uh, would appreciate the uh, clarity with which he uh, presented the story of antibiotics. Uh, there he uh, described the role of the ribosome in, in, in the process of uh, protein synthesis and their binding with antibiotics. Tomorrow he will give a more detailed lecture, more technical lecture on ribosomes in Imtech, Chandigarh. And so today and tomorrow he is spending in Chandigarh, Mohali regions. Since I have given introduction about his personal background uh, this morning, I will wait for a different audience. And part of it would be reflected in the citation that would be read, that would be read out by Dr. Chandrima Shah. I am not going to uh, talk about uh, this his background, and I am sure many of you are already familiar with it. All I would like to add is that Dr. Uh, Ramakrishnan is going to give this lecture. This is the first time the Alagar Medal lecture is being given in Aysar Mohani. We are grateful to INSA for choosing our premises for this. He is going to speak to us on 100 years of visualizing molecules. With these remarks, I welcome Dr. Ramakrishnan. Thank you very much. It's a, both a pleasure and a privilege to be here to give this talk. Um, we are about 100 years into the first time that we could see molecules. And so I thought it would be uh, a good idea to sort of see how we got to uh, our current level of understanding and where some of the future is. So if you, the first of all, you have to Science has always advanced when you've been able to see things. And for instance, uh, for centuries, people were arguing about how the 
human body actually worked. But it's because people had not systematically, you know, looked at the body and dissected it and, and actually looked at things. And uh, one of the first people to do this was this man, Andreas Vesalius, who wrote a famous textbook of human anatomy. And the way he did that was he used to steal corpses, you know, from the cemetery and, and dissect them. And um, anyway, that was one of the ways that he uh, obtained a detailed understanding of the internal uh, anatomy of a human. But the, the thing about it is that you can, he could only see what he could see with his naked eye. And if you really wanted to know then what were these tissues made of, etc., you would have to uh, actually look at them in some detail. And that again led to another step, and that is, you know, I, I must apologize to those of you who have seen this before, you have to think about how you would visualize small objects. And the point is that if you take an object, you can take a magnifying lens and it'll collect the scattered rays and make it into a uh, magnified image. Now, actually, if there are people standing there, there are a few seats, you know, in the front rows, and you may want to come down. But what I was going to say was that all of you are doing exactly this uh, as we speak. So there are scattered rays going from the screen to the retina and uh, to, to the, through your eye where the lens in your eye condenses those rays to form an image in your retina. And the point is that the information is there whether the lens is there or not. That's the important thing uh, to keep in mind. The scattered rays exist whether there's a lens there or not. And it also means you don't have to collect all of the scattered rays. For instance, all of you are sharing the scattered rays uh, from the screen, and yet each of you is able to form a reasonable image. Now, of course, we need very high resolution. You need to collect all of the scattered rays. But if you want to, so the first application of this to, uh, you know, looking at smaller things was when the microscope uh, was invented. And the first microscope was a very primitive uh, microscope by this man, Leeuwenhoek, who was not even a, originally a scientist. He did this almost as a, a, a side thing. And um, this is a picture of a replica of one of his microscopes. It was a, simply a single lens, and then on top of, on a needle that was very precisely positioned, there would be the sample, and then he would look through the other side uh, to see what he saw. And in those days, of course, you, there was no photography. You had to draw everything. And these are pictures from his book, uh, from his papers. And one of the things I am uh, proud of as a fellow and now president of the Royal Society is although he was uh, lived in Holland, uh, all his works were published as letters to the Royal Society. So it's the Royal Society that actually uh, promoted him and uh, you know propagate, publicized his work. And this led to the understanding that there were small organisms that we couldn't see with the naked eye that could swim around and he called them animalcules but we would call them uh, unicellular organisms or microbes uh, today. Now Robert Hooke who uh, was also played a major role at the Royal Society uh, then could, you know worked along these lines and he found that uh, cork, for instance, was organized into these compartments, which he called cells. And this eventually led to the realization that all living things are organized as cells, and that the cell you can think of as the fundamental unit of life, in much the way that physicists might think of the atom as a you know, fundamental building block of matter. So you can see that just being able to see something has led to really revolutionary advances in our understanding, in this case, uh, of biology. But if you want to look at inside cells, uh, then you have a problem, and that is that the uh, molecules that make up cells uh, are actually too small even to be seen by the most powerful <coughs> light microscopes. So the interesting thing is that human beings knew about molecules long before they were able to see them. So even in the 1800s, chemists had figured out that matter is made up of atoms, 
and that atoms can bond with each other in specific ways uh, to make molecules. Even, you know, things like the structure of benzene, uh, you know, and more complicated molecules were all figured out without ever having seen a single molecule, okay? So it's an amazing triumph of human intellectual achievement that people will, were able to figure out that molecules existed, what their properties were, uh, in many cases, you know, uh, and about various groups and so on. And if you want to read about how pe people went from knowing nothing about matter to realizing it's made up of atoms and atoms are made up of molecules, then uh, this is a very good book that I recommend. So, a big breakthrough occurred almost exactly 100 years ago, in 1912, so 103 years ago. Uh, but, and that was made by uh, Max von Laue, uh, a physicist in Germany, who uh, took a crystal and hit it with a beam of x-rays and looked at the scattered x-rays in a photograph. And he saw that, in fact, the x-ray scattering pattern was in the form of these very precisely defined uh, spots. And he realized that this meant that x-rays are waves because what these spots were, were interference uh, from the, excuse me, can you, uh, stop, thanks. You can stop until I'm finished, okay, thank you. So, he realized that the x-rays were interfering through these three-dimensional arrays of atoms. And um, what that did was focus, you know, you had constructive interference along certain directions, and he uh, correctly surmised that x-rays are waves. And he then went on to interpret this pattern, and he suggested that he had a mixture of five wavelengths, and that's why it gave this complicated pattern for zinc sulfide. It turns out that his interpretation was wrong, okay? His general idea was correct, uh, but his interpretation, detailed interpretation, wasn't correct. And the person who made the correct interpretation was a PhD student named Lawrence Bragg in, in Cambridge. Now, Bragg went on to figure out the following. So what he realized is, is that x-rays are indeed waves and that you are getting interference uh, between the atoms in the crystal, which are regular arrays, regular planes uh, of atoms. So to understand how this works, you can, if you have two waves and you're adding them up, then what will happen is the resulting wave will be the sum of these amplitudes. So the amplitude is what, however high the wave is above some mean line, a zero line. And if you add up the amplitude uh, of each wave at each point, then you'll get the uh, addition of these two waves. So if you, if you have an object and it's different parts of the object are scattering x-rays, and then they're going off in a different direction, then what you have to do is you have to add up the two scattered waves. But that's that doesn't mean just adding up the strength of the waves. What you have to know also is what is the relationship of each wave to the other. That is, here you can see the, the crest is here, the peak, and here the peak is a little bit behind. Similarly, the trough is here, the minimum, and here the minimum is a little bit behind. So that's called the phase difference. I'll come to that later. But you, so you, can, you need to know both in order to be able to add the waves correctly. To give you an idea of how it works, imagine if the peak here coincided with the trough here, then the whole wave would cancel out because uh, what would be positive here would be negative here, and what would be negative here would be positive here, and the wave would cancel out and you'd get a zero line. But on the other hand, let's suppose that the two peaks coincided and the two troughs coincided. Then you would get a wave of the same quality, but that would be twice as strong, okay? Now, I'll show you a little movie to show you how this works. So you can see as it's moving, the resulting wave is getting stronger or can go to zero, okay? So watch as the troughs line up and as they exactly cancel each other out. 
Okay, so you can see how waves can constructively interfere to reinforce each other, or they can destructively interfere to cancel each other out. Now, all of you probably know this from elementary physics, but the big uh, thing was that Bragg figured out the precise relationship between the crystal lattice and where these spots should be. And this is just a, a picture of his original paper. Because he was a, only a PhD student, it had to be communicated by the head of the department to the Cambridge Philosophical Society. The head of the department was J.J. Thompson, who, as you know, discovered the electron. And so this is the idea behind uh, Bragg's law, what we call Bragg's law. He said that crystals consist of planes of atoms. And if you think of light scattering, then it's effectively like reflecting off these planes. So you can have an x-ray that's incident here, and one of the x-ray beams, you know, one of the photons may scatter off the first plane and another off the next plane, okay? Or one part of the wave can scatter off the first plane, another off the next plane. And so what you see then is that when they emerge, then the net result is you have to add up these waves. But what you realize is that the second ray has traveled a little bit further than the first wave. Exactly how much further is given by this quantity L or 2L. So it has had to go a little bit further down and then a little bit further out. And the extra distance it has had to travel is 2L, because if it reached this point, it would travel the same as this wave, and if it comes back from this point, it would travel the same as this wave. So it's this 2L that's the extra distance. Now, you can relate that 2L to the distance between the planes and the scattering angle by this formula, 2L is equal to 2D sine of the scattering angle, because this scattering angle is the same as this angle, this simple trigonometry. So, what you then see is that you get from this that, now, going back to the interference thing, if that distance is a whole number of wavelengths, then uh, the troughs and, and crests will match up again, because it has gone back exactly one whole wave, so everything will be aligned again. And so, it will reinforce each other. And any other angle, they, they will slowly go out of uh, sync. Okay, some, some of them will perfectly cancel and others will be greatly reduced. But it's only when you have exactly this condition where it's a whole number of wavelengths that the waves will re reinforce each other. And so, if you have a whole number of wavelengths, then you have this condition satisfied. And the other thing that Brad realized is that the same lattice can be thought of as many different types of planes. For instance, here is a, a lattice. Forget about the lines, just look at the points. And now you can draw lines in this direction, and then your Bragg condition will only be satisfied when you have some particular angle, which makes it a whole number of wavelengths. But now you can have a different set of lattice planes, which is exactly the same atoms, but you're thinking of it as different planes. Here, too, you could have a Bragg reflection. So if you were to rotate this lattice so that the, it met this condition, what, what you would have then is a different scattering angle because the distance between the planes has been different. So what he said was that these spots all come from satisfying this interference condition from completely uh, different sets of planes in the lattice. He then, the first thing he did was to analyze von Lowe's data, and he showed that actually the result of von Lowe's diffraction experiment could be explained if he had all possible wavelengths impinging on the crystal. And so only the wavelengths that satisfied the Bragg condition would give rise to spots, and they would come from different sets of planes. And he showed that really the structure that von Lowe got was wrong, and he, he proposed the correct structure for zinc sulfide. It's what's called Physicists call that a face-centered cubic lattice. He then went on to analyze the simplest thing that he could think of that was a molecule, 
and that is common salt. And when he did the experiment, he, uh, the data agreed, he tried to fit the pattern with different types of lattices. And what he found out was that the lattice fit best with an interpenetrating face-centered cubic lattice in which the sodium and chloride ions were alternately arranged uh, in this uh, sort of three-dimensional chessboard or checkerboard uh, arrangement. Now, the first thing you see from this is there's no molecule of sodium chloride, okay? It's just a bunch of sodium and chloride ions which are alternating in the lattice. There's no single molecule of sodium chloride. Any of these could be considered, a, any pair could be considered a sodium chloride molecule. So, uh, the chemists were not happy about this. First of all, Bragg was this young graduate student, and then the chemists said, who is this physics graduate student trying to tell us chemists, you know, what our molecules look like? The guy doesn't know anything, you know? And so, when Nature had a, a report on a, a lecture that Bragg gave, it drew an angry reply from Henry Armstrong, who was the professor of chemistry at University College London. And the, the title of the letter was Poor Common Salt. <laughs> and uh, what he said was, some books are lies from end to end, and scientific speculation would seem to be on the way to this state. And, and then he said, on, on page 414, Professor Bragg asserts that in sodium chloride there appears to be no molecules represented by sodium chloride and the equality is arrived by a chessboard pattern of these arrangements. It's a result of geometry and not of a pairing off of the atoms. He said, this statement is more than repugnant to common sense. It's absurd to the nth degree. And then what might be the ultimate insult you know, if you're English or, or, or Indian, actually, these days. He said, it's not chemical cricket, you know. <laughs> and so, so anyway, uh, this was the thing. But the reality is that Bragg was correct, okay, and the chemists were wrong, and eventually the chemists all accepted uh, what, you know, solids look like and what molecules look like. Now, this idea of sodium chloride, sodium chloride is a very simple molecule. So if you collect your diffraction data, you have a bunch of spots, you can tr start to make different guesses at what the molecule looks like. And pretty soon you can get an idea of whether it agrees with the diffraction pattern or not. Okay? But for more complicated molecules, uh, it's not possible uh, to, 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 you know, by guesswork, arrive at the structure. Because as soon as the molecule becomes too complex, then it's almost impossible to try all the possible ways in which things can combine. So this idea that, so what was realized is what a lens is doing is recombining the rays to form an image. Now, in fact, what a lens does is does a Fourier transform on the scattered rays uh, to combine the image. Now the fact is you can, you can do the Fourier transform by computation, okay? And so this idea of recombining scattered waves by a so-called Fourier analysis was, was, was um, proposed by W.H. Bragg, who was Lawrence Bragg's father. And I should say Bragg uh, won the Nobel Prize almost exactly 101 years ago, that is to say in 1915. And he shared it with his father because his father uh, developed the X-ray spectrometer, uh, which was uh, involved in a lot of these uh, measurements. But it was Lawrence Bragg who worked out the theory and who actually determined a lot of crystal structures. And luckily, somebody on the Nobel Committee knew that Lawrence Bragg was working completely independently. He was in Cambridge, he had nothing to do with his father except that, you know, he, they would communicate. And, uh, and therefore awarded him the Nobel Prize along with his father for work that he did when he was a PhD student. And uh, even t today, he's the youngest ever Nobel laureate in science. He got it at the age of 25. And he was, until about two years ago, when Malala won the Peace Prize, he was the youngest ever uh, Nobel laureate. So, anyway, W.H. Bragg uh, went on to 
uh, talk about this Fourier uh, recombination. And the way you can think of that is, here are the two waves. Now you can think of the height of the wave from a zero line to the maximum as the amplitude of the wave. It's also called the scattering amplitude. And you can think of the relative crest uh, of a second wave relative to the first one as a phase angle called phi, okay? And so, as long as you have a reference wave, you can, each, any other wave can be characterized by an amplitude and a phase angle. Now, a convenient way to represent uh, such waves is by representing it as a vector in a two-dimensional plane, uh, something like a complex vector. So what you then have is you can have a circle whose radius is the amplitude of the wave, and the direction of the vector uh, will be uh, represented by the phase angle. So essentially, you're taking this information and mathematically uh, representing it as a two-dimensional vector, okay? So it's a mathematical convenience, but remember, you're dealing with waves, okay? But the, why would you want to do this? The reason you would want to do this is that now addition of waves becomes very simple. It becomes just vector addition. To give you an idea, Supposing a second wave is a whole number of wavelengths, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in phase difference. Well, if it's a whole number of wavelengths, then phi has to be a multiple of 2 pi, okay? And that means that the second vector will have come all around at least, you know, an, an integral number of times and will simply add up with the first vector. Similarly, if the two waves are exactly apart, then they're exactly pi uh, in angle apart, so the second vector will be in this direction, and they'll exactly cancel each other. So that, that movie that I showed you would work if you just did this vector addition. And for any other intermediate value, you would simply have something that's the vector sum of these two vectors. So it's a, it's a convenience, a mathematical convenience to represent it this way. Now, a big problem when you measure these spots, you know, so if you measure these spots here, you're only getting the amplitude. So, you know, you see some spots are weak, some spots are strong. So strong means that the wave has a higher amplitude. In fact, it's proportional, the intensity is proportional to the square of the amplitude. And the weaker ones have a weaker amplitude. But what, it, what this information doesn't tell you is this phase angle phi. You don't know what that phase angle is. And so, in, if you want to do what is called a Fourier transform, you have to know both the phase angle and the scattering amplitude. You cannot do it with just one of the, the two components. And so, the, the whole problem that crystallographers have is determining the phase angle. It's called the phase problem in crystallography. Now, <clears throat> A big breakthrough was obtained by this Canadian uh, crystallographer named Patterson. And what Patterson realized is that even without knowing the phase angle, even by just measuring the amplitudes, you could calculate a function called a Patterson function or an autocorrelation function, which would give you the, all of the vectors between atoms in the structure, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, let's take this crystal here. This has two moderately heavy atoms and a light atom. Now, if you look at all possible vectors between these atoms, what you see is you can have a vector going from this atom to this one, or from this one uh, to this one, and or from this one to this one, okay? So if you calculated a Patterson function, it would look like this. You would get a large peak, which would represent ve a vector from here to here, or on the opposite side would be the vector from here to here. So you get a peak here and a peak here. And then notice that they're in the same direction and magnitude as this dis interatomic distance. Then you would get an intermediate peak, which would be from a heavy atom to a light atom along this direction, and then 
one going this way and one going this way, and that's what these two are. And similarly, you'd get one going this way and one going this way, and that's what these two are. But notice that this peak is much stronger than this peak, and that's because it's weighted by the number of electrons in each atom. And so here you have a, mu a multiplicative effect of two heavy atoms, and here you, you have one light atom, so it's, it'll be a lot weaker. And if you had two light atoms, it would be even weaker. So from the Patterson, you might get very heavy peaks that correspond, strong peaks that correspond to the distances between the heaviest atoms in the structure, okay? And if you then know where that heavy atom is, then from the Patterson, that allows you to figure out from the strongest peaks, it allows you to figure out where the heavy atom is. Then you can ask, supposing I had a structure with no other atoms but just that heavy atom, and I can do the back calculation, which is I can figure out, knowing the structure, what the scattering should be. That's an easy problem because you have the structure and you simply have to do a Fourier transform of the structure and you'll get a, the scattering uh, peaks. So that will then have an amplitude which is not correct and a phase which is also not correct because you're not putting in the whole of the structure. You now throw away the incorrect amplitude and you take the correct, incorrect phase. Now this phase will be incorrect, but it won't be random, okay? And so if you, even though it's not co completely correct or even partially correct, it's only slightly correct, it will have some information in it. It won't be random. So you take that incorrect phase and combine it with your measured amplitudes. When you do that, you will get something that looks more like your structure, and you'll be able to start fitting in more atoms. Then you do this in an iterative way. You then calculate another Fourier transform, calculate better phases, combine them with the original data, you'll get even better phases. So this is sort of how it works. So here is an example where the original Patterson showed these two very strong peaks. But notice that even though you didn't put in any other atoms, when you do this partial Fourier species, other atoms started to appear, but they're weaker, okay? Now what you could do is you could fit in atoms here, 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 etc., and then recalculate, and then these atoms would show up stronger than other atoms would appear, and then you'd have to fit those in. Now, the person who was really one of the world's experts at doing very complicated problems using the Patterson method was Dorothy Hodgkin. And in fact, you know, many, for instance, people like Vijayan and Ramaseshan who were, you know, pioneers in crystallography in India were trained by her. Now, she was responsible for a number of very important molecules like penicillin, which is shown here. And again, you know, even though it was much later, chemists didn't believe her because it had this square beta lactam ring and they thought that it would be energetically unfavorable, etc. But, but again, of course, she was proved to be correct. And she's also the only person who's had two postage stamps, you know, only scientist that I know of who's had two postage stamps after her. So this is from her Nobel lecture to show you how this works. So the, one of the most complicated compounds she did was vitamin B12. And vitamin B12 uh, has a cobalt atom, which is much heavier than carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen. So when she calculated a Patterson function, she was able to determine where the cobalt atom was in the lattice. Then she used that cobalt atom to do a partial Fourier synthesis, then used the phases from that with her real measured data, and this is what she got. So the cobalt atom shows up very strongly because it's what was put in. But other atoms also start showing up. They don't show up perfectly because the phases came only from the cobalt atom. So they didn't come from the whole structure. And, but now if you start putting in these atoms and recalculate and get better phases and then uh, calculate the map again, then those atoms start showing up much better. And then you can keep on doing this <coughs> until you have, uh, you know, the real structure, complete atomic structure.